our money says in God we trust, but our economy looks like the seven deadly sins. Your Bible doesn't call it interest. Your Bible calls it usury. I'm going to talk a lot about usury tonight because I want to teach you about this. Because this is really the root of their problem here. Interest on money was condemned as a mortal sin. It, it was put on the level at least of theft and sometimes compared with murder. God designed this system so that there wouldn't be this, you know, this, this elite of just one or two or a few people that have all this wealth and all this power to be able to oppress the people. And what we're going to be dealing more is that is with that oppression and that oppression of usury. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion. The national debt, just write that, national debt, the debt that we are in as a nation. First of all, Americans are like sheep. They never ask themselves questions. If we have a national debt of $6 trillion, it would be interesting to know who we owe. Can you ever ask yourself that question? Well, the national debt, well, what is it? Who do we owe? Where'd we get the money? What'd we borrow it for? What's the interest rate? Who are we paying back? We don't know. We just go on. Listen to this. The national debt in 1901 was one billion dollars, one. It stayed there until World War I and it went up 25 billion dollars after World War I. A jump from one billion to 25 billion as a result of one war. To whom do the citizens of the United States of America owe seven trillion dollars? Wait, it's growing, are you ready? It's growing one billion six million dollars a day. How's it growing if we're not borrowing anymore? Thank you! But your Bible doesn't call it interest. Your Bible calls it usury. I dare you to touch somebody and say, you're using me. Oh, uh-huh. See, when that banker comes along and said, well, it's just thus and so interest, you ought to look right back at him and say, you're using me. See, you don't think you can get out. You're looking at me like it's a mocking dream. Here's what your Bible says, Exodus 22, 25. If you lend money to any of my people that are poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shall thou lay upon him usury, neither shall you lay upon him interest. Leviticus 25, 36 and 37. Take thou no interest of him or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee, that thou shalt not give him the money by interest, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Deuteronomy 23, 20. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand unto, to the land whither thou goest to possess it. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them, around the banks, will deprive the people of their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Do you know right now, if we got together as the American people and we sold every building, and every square inch of American soil for the total amount of its worth, we would have to pay back that America and two more. Somebody owns this nation. There are three types of conquest. Number one, war. Captives hate and rise up against the aggressors and it takes too much force and money to maintain a situation where you have taken a nation captive by war. Secondly, religious conquest. 
But by nature, religion lacks military force to regain control once the captives are disillusioned. The third form is economic conquest. Place the people under tribute with no visible force, no marching army, no guns, no police, no KGB, no secret service. Take them captive by requiring tribute of them, by requiring them to pay you interest. Here, here. Tribute is collected by legal debts and taxes. Therefore, those that are paying them believe they are paying for their own good and the good of others and to protect them from some unseen enemy. Now watch. The captors become the benefactors and the protectors. In other words, you're paying tribute for what you believe to be his protection. Does that sound like organized crime to you? But you never looked at interest that way. Why are you looking at me so funny? You want me to go on? Matthew 4.10 Worship the Lord your God and him only shalt thou serve. Exodus 20 verse 3 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything but to love him. I'm here to prove to you that bankers, especially in the Federal Reserve System, make multiplied trillions of dollars and never create one thing of value. Are you with me? Do you want to learn this or not? Are you sure? An automaker might make 1% or 2% profit. A builder might make 10% profit. But the printers of money have no limit to the, ab ab to the amount of money they can create and the wealth that they can create for themselves. Money's the bloodline of a civilized society. It's the instrument by which a product is sold or bought. Reduce the supply of money below the necessary levels to sustain trade. Reduce the amount of this in the system below the levels necessary to sustain the current trade and you create a depression. In 1930, let me ask you a question. Did we not have farms? In 1930, did we not have factories? Did we have the greatest roadway system in the world at that time? Yes. Did we have the greatest communication system in the world at that time? Yes. Did we, did we have the greatest uh, uh, opportunity of trade with oceans on both sides and water systems like the Mississippi River running through the width and breadth of this nation? Did we have ability to move our goods and services? Yes. Did we have transportation and roadways? Yes. What did we not? Did we lack workers? Then what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The bankers decided no more money for you. They got out of the stock market. I can give you the family names. They got out of the stock market the year before. Do you know all the money that was lost in the stock market as people began to sell their stocks one after the other after the other after the other and stocks that were valued at $10,000 were selling for 15 cents? And then they had to make a run on the bank. So the banks collapsed. The stock market collapsed all at the whim of the bankers who decided they wanted to make the money. Watch me. Watch me. All that stuff was being sold. $100,000 farms were selling for $3,000. Who do you think bought them? Why are you looking at me funny? You know what you're looking at? 
You're looking like sheep that have been led to the slaughter and didn't know it. I'm going to continue. Can I continue? We didn't lack industrial capability. If you don't believe me, I just told you what started the Great Depression. Let me tell you what ended it. World War II. And all of a sudden, the same banks that said no money for farms, no money for food, put people in soup lines, no money for commerce, no money for railroads, no money for roads, no money, no money, all of a sudden said war. And all of a sudden factories that were closed down began to work three shifts. Where'd the money come from? The same pockets that refused to give it before. Because they decide when it will be printed, how much will be printed, and how much usury or interest will be paid. Not the federal government. The federal government has no say in it, as I will prove to you. Say, debt, debt. is a devil. By the simple manipulation of a few wealthy bankers, World War II ended the Great Depression. After successive failures to convince the public of the need of a central bank by wars, these same European bankers financed both sides of the Civil War in this country. You don't even know that. Same bankers, same families, financed both sides of the Civil War. Why? They make the money. After they couldn't get the American people to swallow the lie of a central bank by creating war, they decided they would artificially create, listen to me, recessions, depressions, inflations, and panics. Since only a small amount of deposits are stored at the bank, about 20%, the other 80% is out on loan with security of property and your promise to pay it back. A simple rumor of a bank's insolvency would make a run on that bank. Everybody would get nervous, go pull their money out of the bank, and that bank would collapse. And then the international bankers who started the rumor in the first place would look like prophets. One of the key movers and shakers of this uh, let's get a central bank by making the people afraid by causing their banks to collapse. One of the key movers and shakers was a man by the name of, you might recognize it, J.P. Morgan. His father was an agent for the wealthy, you might know this name, Rothschild family. Here's a quote. The Federal Reserve. In 1869, J.P. Morgan went to London and reached an agreement for a company known as the Southern Northern Securities that was intended to act as the international bank, as, as the agent for the Rothschild Company in the United States. The first major panic created by the international bankers occurred in 1893 when local bankers from around the nation were told to call in all their loans. Told by who? By these wealthy bankers. Senator Robert Owen testified before a congressional committee that the call on the banks, watch, testified before a congressional committee that the bank he owned, this was a senator, received from the National Bankers Association what came to be known as the Panic Circular of 1893. It stated, you will at once retire one-third of your circulation and call in one-half of all your loans. Why? Because that makes the bank collapse. Why do they want to create a panic to make these banks collapse? Because these banks are under their control. They're the ones that called in the loans. Therefore, they wanted a central bank. They wanted one place to control the money and the wealth of this nation and its people as well. And they couldn't get it. So they created these panics. Listen to this. A representative of the Rothschild interests, J.P. Morgan, 
was preparing for the next scheduled event in the creation of America's Central Bank. During the early months of 1907, Morgan was in Europe for five months, shuttling back and forth between London and Paris, the homes of the two branches of the Rothschild banking family. The reason Morgan was in Europe was a decision was being made to have Morgan participate a, or precipitate a bank panic in America. When he returned, he started rumors that the Knickerbocker Bank in New York was insolvent. The bank's depositors became frightened because they thought that Morgan, being the best known banker of the day, might very well be right. Their panic started a run on the bank. Morgan was right, and the panic at Knickerbocker also caused runs on other banks, and the panic of 1907 was complete. The propaganda started almost immediately that the state chartered bankers could not be trusted anymore with the banking affairs of the nation. The need for a central bank became apparent by the panic of 1907, or at least this is how the conspiracy argued. Historian Frederick Lewis Allen, writing in Life magazine, became aware of the plot. He wrote, certain chroniclers have arrived at the ingenious conclusion that the Morgan interests took advantage of the unsettled conditions during the autumn of 1907 to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed so that it would kill off rival banks and consolidate the pre eminence of the banks within the J.P. Morgan orbit. Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University in 1907, spoke to the American people attempting to remove whatever blame might be placed upon the Morgan shoulders. He said, all this trouble could be averted. Now listen to this. All this trouble could be averted if we would appoint a committee or, of six or seven public-spirited minds like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of the money of our nation. So Wilson wanted to hand over the affairs of the nation to the very person who had caused the panic in the first place, J.P. Morgan and six or seven of his associates. Are you learning anything? Okay, I, 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 let me hurry. The individual bankers, the solution, of course, a central bank. The individual the bankers used to introduce the legislation that created the central bank was a senator from Rhode Island and maternal grandfather of the Rockefeller brothers, David Nelson et al., by the name of Nelson Aldrich. He was appointed to a National Monetary Committee and charged to make a thorough study of the financial practices before formulating bank and current and, and reform legislation. For two years, the commission toured the banking houses of Europe, learning the secrets of central banking system in Europe. Upon Aldrich's return in November of 1910, he boarded a train to Hoboken, New Jersey, for a ride to Jekyll Island, Georgia. His destination was the Jekyll Island Hunt Club, which was owned by J.P. Morgan. It was here that the legislation that would give America its central bank was written. Aboard the train with Senator Aldrich, and later joining them in Georgia, were A. Pyatt Andrew, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Senator Nelson Aldrich, the National Monetary Commission, Frank Vanderlip, President of Kuhn and Loeb's National City Bank of New York, Henry Davidson Sr., partner of the J.P. Morgan, Charles Norton, President of J.P. Morgan's First National Bank of New York, Paul Arberg, partner in the banking house of Kuhn, Loeb and & Company, and Benjamin Strong, President of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. The railroad car that these gentlemen traveled and belonged to Senator Ulrich, and while they were aboard, they were sworn to secrecy and asked to refer to each other by first names only. On one, of the first, one of those, Mr. Vanderlip, later went on to reveal his role in writing the bill that created the Federal Reserve System. He wrote in the Saturday Evening Post, In 1910, I was as a secretive, indeed, as, as secretive as any conspirator. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together in the night departure. We were instructed to come one at a time unobtrusively as possible to the terminal 
of the New Jersey literal on the Hudson where Senator Aldrich's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of the train for the South. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. Discovery, we knew, simply must not happen or else all the time and effort would be wasted. Notice that the conspirators did not want the American people to know what they had in store for them. A central bank, the legislation was to to be written not by a group of legislators, but a group of bankers, mostly connected with the man responsible for 1907's panic, J.P. Morgan. The conspiracy also had one additional problem. They had to avoid the name Central Bank. And for that reason, they had come up with the designation of the Federal Reserve System. It would be owned by private individuals who would draw profit from the ownership of shares and who would control the nation's issuance of money. It would have as its command the nation's entire financial resources and it would be able to mobilize and mortgage the United States by involving the United States in major wars. Woodrow Wilson, he was elected, he was inaugurated in January of 1913. In December of 1913, he signed the Federal Reserve Act, bringing the Federal Reserve System into place in America and did what Thomas Jefferson said must never happen. He took the control of the money away from the people by taking it away from the Congress and gave it to a group of private individuals. My whole point, somebody asked me, Pastor, why are you sharing that? My whole point is to let you know you're in bondage and don't know it. You're serving two masters and you don't know it. They are using you and you don't know it. The religion of the Antichrist has seeped into our Christian churches and eventually will take over. And we need to know what's coming down the pipeline. And we need to know how to defend ourselves and how to push back and proclaim truth. Because truth is going to set people free. In the book of Revelation now, chapter 13, we pick up in verse number 4. And this is in reference to the Antichrist. And they worshipped the dragon, that is Satan. And they worshipped Satan which gave power unto the beast of the Antichrist. And they worshiped the beast of the Antichrist, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Now, I want you to notice one thing. The Antichrist system is a mixture of finances, politics, and religion. Three ingredients. The Antichrist system cannot function without having total financial control. They also have to have total political control, and they have to have total religious control. It's a three-legged stool that they have built on, that Satan has built on. These followers will not be located in just one area, will be present in the nations of all the earth. They cannot be loyal to the national government where they live, but will be loyal to the international cause for which the world dictator stands. In other words, the followers of the Antichrist will be internationalists, not nationalists. They will have no allegiance to the religion to the government in the country they live in. The New World Order is being achieved via economics, where tyrants of old tried to use military force. They now try to use economics as a tool to accomplish their goals. Baron Rothschild said, and I quote, Give me control over a nation's currency, and I care not who makes its laws, close quote. Are you with me still? Well, in 1913, we gave Rothschild and the houses of Warburg, J.P. Morgan, Kuhn, Loeb, Lehman, and Rockefeller our nation's currency. President Woodrow Wilson 
led Congress to create the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is not a federal agency. It has nothing to do with the federal government or any other government agency. It is a private corporation. It has no oversight, zero accountability. It is a private corporation run by mostly foreign bankers. We hear some of the reporters asking members of Congress, where is the bailout money going that we gave to Wall Street? And what is the answer that we get back? We don't know. Why do we not know? Because Congress has never held oversight over the Federal Reserve. They do what they want to do. And most of the taxes that we pay to the Internal Revenue Service, which is merely a collection arm for the Federal Reserve, does not go to fund the Federal Government. It goes to pay the debt to the Federal Reserve and mostly interest at that. Admiral Chester Ward, Rear Admiral, was a Judge Advocate General of the Navy from 1956 to 1960, a former member of the CFR who pulled out after realizing what they were all about, warned the American people about the dangers of this and similar organizations such as the Trilateral Commission. He said, and I quote Admiral Chester Ward, the most powerful clique in these elitist groups have one objective in common. They want to bring about the surrender of the sovereignty and the national independence of the United States. A second clique of international members in the CFR comprises the Wall Street international bankers and their key agents. Primarily, they want the world banking monopoly from whatever power ends up in the control of global government. Admiral Ward also said, the main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and submergence into an all-powerful one-world government, close quote. Rear Admiral Chester Ward, former Judge Advocate General of the United States Navy. In a letter written to Colonel House, that he wasn't a military colonel, it's an honorary title, President Franklin Roosevelt wrote this and said to Mr. House, quote, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government of the United States since the days of Andrew Jackson, close quote. Old Hickory, Andy Jackson did his best to rid the United States from the death grip that the international bankers were beginning to exert on this country. He was probably the last president to actually oppose the bankers, although there are some who suggest that John Kennedy tried to do it and that's why he was assassinated. In discussing the bank renewal bill with a delegation of bankers in 1832, Jackson said, and I'm giving you this word perfect, word perfect, to the international bankers, 1832. Gentlemen, and I'll try to do it as he did it, because history is pretty loquacious with its explanation of how Andy Jackson delivered this message, a colorful personality, to say the least. Gentlemen, I've had men watching you for a long time, and I'm convinced that you have used the funds of the bank to speculate in the breadstuffs of the country. When you won, you divided the profits amongst you, and when you lost, you charged it to the bank. You tell me that if I take the deposits from the bank and annul its charter, I shall ruin 10,000 families. That may be true, gentlemen. But that is your sin. Should I let you go on 
you will ruin 50,000 families, and that would be my sin. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the eternal God, I will rout you out. Close quote. I don't fear anything, quite frankly. I'm willing to accept whatever that price is because I have watched so many people before me who have paid the ultimate price and so many whose names we'll never know. So many people, good and decent people, who stood up against all odds and accepted certain death because they could not sit by and watch what is effectively a gang rape of the planet. We sit by and we watch a gang rape and we do nothing about it. Of course, in this room, we have a whole host of people who are doing something, and it is an honor and a privilege to be amongst people who care enough to do something. And I believe wholeheartedly that when we take full responsibility, and I believe that is the period we are in right now, it is the, it is the challenge of all times. It is an amazing time to be alive. And if we do everything that we're capable of, we will wrest away this power and we will take hold, we'll take responsibility, and we will create a better world. And in conclusion, what I will say is that if there is one single thing that we must do, it will not, we will not have a better world unless we do this. And we could do this tomorrow if we really want to. We must take away the private control of the issuance of money. What we have is a situation in which a tiny, tiny minority, many of whom call themselves Jewish, although I think they're much more satanic and sadistic than anything else, but we have a tiny group of individuals who have been given the power to print and issue an infinite supply of money. Think about that for one second. An infinite supply of money. Imagine that you yourself had an infinite supply of money. If I had an infinite supply of money, what I would probably do is immediately I want clean drinking water for everyone on this planet. I want it achievable tomorrow. I want it now. I want a house for everyone. Everyone will have a shelter over their head. I want proper healthy food for everyone on this planet. I want everyone to have everything that they require to live a dignified life. We could do that tomorrow. We could take back the power of, of issuing money and we could have that power tomorrow. But instead we allow this tiny group of psychopaths to issue an infinite supply of money and with that money they buy everything and everyone that can be bought. And sadly, many of our brothers and sisters are all too cheap and can be bought for any, any amount of money. It's disgraceful. In the United States, these prostitutes probably can be bought for a few grand on a boat. And this will never change, never, 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 unless we take back the control of the private issuance of money. It has to be in the hands of the people. It has to be transparent. And as real Christians, and every Muslim knows, usury is unacceptable. It is one of the greatest crimes, if not the greatest crime, that is committed. And it is causing all of this mayhem. If we take back the control of the issuance of money, no longer will these Saudi Arabian disgusting psychopaths, our little proxy state, be able to arm these psychopaths who are mercenaries. Mercenaries do not work for free, as one of my friends just said recently. Take away the money, and these psychopaths will no longer do the work that they do, because they want the money. We take back control of the money, we can turn this world around tomorrow. If we do not do this, I don't care how many things we do, I'm telling you, they will outspend us a billion to one, and they will beat us on every level. So I think that's a very optimistic thing. Focus on one simple matter, and every other problem you can solve very quickly. What would Jesus do is a great question, I think, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's great that we can look at the Gospels and we can see some of the things that Jesus did, and Jesus hung out with uh, the folks on the margins and, and uh, preached the Gospel of radical love and grace and frustrated the religious elite and said to the self-righteous religious folks, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. 
and we wonder what got him in trouble, you know. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, the, the question, what would Jesus do, is a great one in a world of materialism and militarism, and it should uh, keep us up at night sometimes. Jesus talked some about hell, but he talked a whole lot about heaven. And uh, heaven, not just as a place that we go to when we die, but something that we're to bring down to earth. The growing gap between the really rich and the really poor is the most desperate moral question of our times. And so he wrestles with that within his world. But I think all of us have to wrestle with the the inequities and, and, and think, wow, I mean, right now, 5% of the world's population is consuming almost 45% of the world's stuff. And what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself in a global family that is so dysfunctional, you know, that some people are dying because they don't even have clean water or they don't have mosquito nets that would prevent malaria and only cost $3. So I think this gospel that we talk about uh, it's been said, comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable, and that's the gospel of Jesus. My argument is based on the Bible. It begins with the Word of God in the Old Testament, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Nehemiah, Ezekiel, the Psalms. Then we move to the New Testament. We go from God the Father to God the Son, Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6, verses 34 and 35. We go from there to the statement from the Apostle that the love of money is the root of all evil. We segue from that point to the early church. The early church taught through Ambrose, through Basil, through all the church fathers that interest on money and not excessive interest, which is the modern Orwellian newspeak for usury, but interest on money as it was always defined until the money power got in control and then falsified it. Interest on money was condemned as a mortal sin. It, it was put on the level at least of theft and sometimes compared with murder. And this is a unanimous and consistent opinion for the entire first millennia of the church. And then you still have the core of that dogma of that dogmatic truth being reinforced and being upheld all the way to the eve of the Renaissance. It's similar to uh, adultery. You can have the very strongest laws and moral opprobrium against adultery, yet you will still have adultery and you will still have those who try to chip away, from, uh, chip away at it by liberalizing divorce laws and creating all kinds of loopholes. It's not really the fault of the church as long as the church resists that. And that's what, that's what Aquinas did. He was faced with all kinds of loopholes and linguistic subterfuges and evasions that agents of the money power were bringing into his era and his time. And he responded to those. And he didn't at all weaken the uh, dogmatic truth, the magisterium of the church as it opposed usury. But nonetheless, you began to confront a more systematic nibbling away and gnawing away because what we're dealing with here is gradualism. There was no way that the money power could come in in a thoroughly revolutionary manner, at least until it, capt it captured the papacy. Once it captured the papacy, then you began to see the footprints of the revolution. But before that, it had to march gradually. It had to use gradualism and situation ethics. And then you came to the pontificate of Leo X, the first of the two Medici popes. Clement VII was the other one. And you began to have a revolutionary aspect of gradualism. And there, in other words, there was an enormous gnawing away. It was still a gnawing. It, it didn't actually remove the entire pillar. And of course, these cryptocrats who had captured the Vatican and the papacy were far too witty to ever actually say what uh, would be said by modernists later on that usury was not a sin. We now have modernist libertarian uh, so-called Roman Catholics such as Thomas Woods who openly say usury isn't a sin. The cryptocrats who had captured the church were far too clever to ever say that and that's why people today will say well the church never changed its law. The church still upholds that usury is a mortal sin. 
And my counter to that is by what definition? Because the church says that whatever is the legal rate is allowable unless, and here comes the loophole, it's unjust. But they don't tell you what's unjust. So here where I am in the state of Idaho, uh, the, uh, the legal interest rate on payday loans is 400%. And all kinds of Roman Catholics are involved in payday loans and charging 400%. No one's refused communion. No one uh, has to uh, uh, confess this in confession. So it's these, it is this flowery rhetoric. That's what you really have. These rhetorical flourishes, which are simply intended to save the conscience of Christians who are troubled by the fact that there's been an enormous departure from the magisterium of the truth, from the, uh, the, from the magisterium of the church, from dogmatic truth. And the other uh, weasel word that we have now is this redefinition, as I mentioned, of usury as being excessive interest. Because people just can't, this modern mentality which is immersed in money getting, and in greed. It's a part of all of our lives. It's woven into our corrupt society. It's the root of all evil. So what do we do epistemologically? How do we escape the fact that the church, all the popes, all the councils, all the theologians, faithful to the Word of God in the Old Testament, faithful to Jesus Christ in the New Testament in Luke, where he said, lend freely, expecting nothing in return, how do we get around the fact that for nearly 1,500 years, 1,500 years, this was the uncontested law of the church? For more than 1,000 years, this is how it was. And remember, we're not talking about eating meat on Friday now. We're not talking about a discipline of the church that was man-made to begin with, based on the idea that Christ had delegated powers to the church by saying what you bind on earth is bound in heaven and vice versa. No, we're talking about the Word of God. And if the Word of God doesn't stand for all time, and if we are not required to obey it and be in obedience to it, then what do we have? And if we're deceiving ourselves, it's because we need to deceive ourselves. It's because our livelihood is derived from interest on money. Or because we believe that a greed is a lesser sin than lust. Whatever it may be, whatever convoluted anthropomorphic illusion we have in our minds, it does not negate and cannot nullify the Word of God. And we cannot gain a victory. We cannot get into the ascendance culturally or sociologically we are losing this battle of ideas because we are disobedient and this fundamental principle. And I put it to you that until we obey, we are not going to have a victory. We will continue to chase band-aid approaches, palliatives, because the enemy has a very, very strong argument against us. I call it inevitabilism that it is the inevitable march of progress and you cannot stand against it. And what they will say is, we'll, we'll hold the fort against this movement of history by giving you the illusion that we're fighting it. We will talk the rhetoric of Christianity. We will hold up the Bible, but we will actually be retreating every step of the way. And usury, the retreat and the nullification and the overthrow of God's law on usury is a macrocosmic picture of what we see microcosmically in terms of these symptoms which bedevil us. We go from defeat to defeat. We blame it on God or we dream of the end of the world or we hide out in our, in our fortresses in the woods, storing our water and food. And it's good to store water and food, by the way. But not if it means that you are not fulfilling the talents that God gave you for a reason. Has he given you many talents? To whom much is given, much is expected. But how can you even use those talents if we are collectively disobeying God? And if we are conspiring with priests and preachers and ministers and popes 
in deluding ourselves into believing that there is some greater evil than the money power. If there is a greater evil than the money power, then the Bible is lying. We need to face facts. We just keep running away from reality. The New Testament says, the love of money is the root of all evil. This is not a complex dilemma. We have a tendency in the West to render what is fundamental and basic and clear and truthful, complicated and complex, because we then give ourselves an excuse not to have to act on it in the way that God wants us to do. And so, to say that the money power is at the very top of the evils that we need to work against, basically overwhelms people. They want to find something else. Now, you can say, well, Catholics have always been greatly concerned for social justice, and you can mention Father McNabb and, and this priest or that priest or Dorothy Day or Peter Moore, and I respect all of them because at the very least, those Catholics that you're citing, uh, at the very least, they tried to relieve the suffering of their fellow man. What our Lord said was, was uh, 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 the least of his brethren. But I'm talking about obeying God. I'm talking about obeying God at the very highest level. Of course we should give alms to the poor. Of course we should bind up the wounds. Because we act as good Samaritans and help the man who has been beaten or assaulted by the side of the road, does that negate our obligation to obey God's Ten Commandments? Of course it doesn't. And so, yes, you had Catholics hungering for social justice as you had Protestants hungering for that. But as long as they were allowing interest on money, the root of all evil, everything that they were doing once you have allowed that was palliation. And so what I say is, is that Christians would be flabbergasted if there was a whorehouse on the block down the street for them. But if there's a whorehouse called a bank, a usury bank down the street for them, they will not only not be horrified, they'll most likely be working in it. And then they're going to, as social justice people who are concerned for the poor, they're going to go along and palliate the wounds of those people who have been injured by interest on debt. There's a satanic level of mockery there. Do you see that? It's a satanic ridicule of us because Jesus intended that we would be overcomers here, that we would be a light unto the world. And instead, we make a mockery of the gospel by these shortcuts that we take, by these deluded thoughts that we have, by the inability to face the truth, and the inability to have enough faith in God to say, God, I'm going to have to abandon interest on money and have faith in you because this is the way you wanted the world to be. This is what you were looking for from us. Adveniat regnum tuam, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celi et in terra. That was his mission and mandate for us in the most perfect prayer there is, the Pater Noster, the Our, the Our Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now how do we do that? Our way or God's way? 